It's almost as if it was deliberately designed to look ugly. Until you got inside, you realized how fantastically precious it really was. Scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, open up my mind. Open up my mind, meditating on the scripture. Meditating on your scripture. Something new every single time. And every single time. Last week, we started the book of Acts. We were in chapter one and two. So, uh, again, just to recap the book of Acts, um, the author is Luke the same author as the book of Luke. Okay. He was a physician. Um, most likely spoke the Greek language, right? <laughs> but an educated man. Uh, this book is like a continuation to his gospel. So if you read the gospel of Luke and then begin to read the book of Acts, it's like one coherent stream of testimony uh, as it goes through. All right. So, uh, let's see in chapter one, we see how, um, he introduces what things were going on in that time, right? How Jesus promised to baptize his disciples with the Holy spirit. Okay. We see that the disciples were, uh, following the command of Jesus was to wait to receive the spirit, not to leave where they were, but to wait until they received the spirit. So in chapter two, we see that something like tongues of fire came over and rested on them and they received the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. Tongues of the languages of the nations around them where all these Jews who were uh, pilgrimaging for the Passover heard these men who were from Galilee, were from the, the, the locality of, of their territory, speaking in these foreign languages and the Holy Spirit just blew the minds of those Jews who were present. And being convicted by Peter's preaching, right, they asked him what must be do to be saved. And Peter told them, you must uh, repent and believe in the one you crucified. He told them straight up. He said, you guys crucified the author of life. You guys crucified the one that God sent. And so now in order to be saved, from this wicked generation, okay? He said, you must uh, repent, believe in the one that was sent, right? And be baptized in his name, okay? And so um, again, alluding to the baptism, the commission that the apostles were put on, right? To baptize the nations in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But also in, in that, the Holy Spirit being the one who's baptizing them truly, right? <clears throat> So we see the act of baptism, right, being a symbolic thing as to what the Holy Spirit is actually doing uh, in the unseen dimension or realm, right? Before we get into the word of God, we will always pray. All right, so let's go before the Father. <clears throat> Holy Father, we come before you now, in Jesus' mighty name, and Father God, we thank you. For all that you do, for all that you've done. Father God, we give you all the glory and honor for allowing us to be able to study your word in peace and in safety, oh God. And in and this time, even to be joyful, to suffer some sort of persecution for your glory, Lord. And Father, we just, um, we ask you that whoever has seen this image pop up on the screen, Lord God, that you would wipe it from their minds and their hearts, Lord. Father, and also that we pray for that person um, who posted that that image, who, who interrupted this meeting, Lord God. We pray that they have a true encounter with you. Father God, it's, it's just like our Lord said on the cross, they know not what they do, truly. And so <clears throat> we'll pray for that person, Lord, that, uh, that you would bring conviction, that you would have some kind of encounter, allowing him to, to come face to face with your truth, and with you, Father, and and hopefully uh, to accept you and be saved and then come to realize what he's done or what she's done, whoever that was, oh God. 
But Father God, right now, I just pray over the souls that are here, Lord, that you uh, continue to guide them through your word. You continue to be their teacher, Father, to, to take them line upon line, step by step through your word, Lord God, so that they may know it and wear it like armor, that they might use it as a sword, oh God, to fight against the things of this world, to fight against the enemy of yours and of ours. And, and Father, just to be blessed, just to be blessed to know why they exist, to know that they have purpose and that they are important to you, that you desire them and uh, that you desire to bless them and to know them and, and for them to be known by you. Father, we, um, we invite you here in this time. We ask you that you forgive us of all of our sins, oh God, whatever things are on our souls right now, that you wash us and cleanse us by the holy blood of your son and, uh, and allow us to come into your presence clean, blameless, Lord, so that we can truly have an awesome fellowship, that it, that it might be a sweet smelling aroma to your nostrils, Father. And Father, uh, again, just you be our teacher. Take us through your word. Write these things on our minds and on our hearts, Lord. We give you all the glory and honor in this time. And all these things we pray in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Again, reading out of the NIV. Acts chapter 3, right from the top. So it says, One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer at three in the afternoon. Now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. Then Peter said, silver or gold, I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. Okay, and so <clears throat> here's this man who has at least enough love from people to help him get to this place in the temple courts where he can beg for alms, right? He would be there asking for money. Now here it is that he asks Peter and John for money. He wasn't even there looking for a miracle. He wasn't looking to be healed. He wasn't out there, oh, I heard about this Messiah, Jesus, and, and I'm here to meet his disciples. None of that. He was going about his regular routine, right? and just seeking money to survive. And here he asked he asked uh, Peter and John for, for money. And instead of giving them money, these dudes healed him, right? Or Peter healed him in the name of Jesus Christ. And so again, considering that sometimes, even though a person may not know right? What they're out here doing, what they're looking for, truly. What Peter did was he enabled this man, right? To, to now go and be able to work and, and, and provide for himself. He fixed this man's disability to, um, to not have to be out here begging anymore for money, but to be able to, to, to survive on his own. And I think that's just, awesome because a lot of people say well you could only receive healing or deliverance if you have faith right and here this man no demonstration of faith didn't even ask for it wasn't even looking for it but god is merciful right and and here these two men of god uh you know just going infiltrating his life you know going above and beyond his own expectation he said, you, don't, you came out here looking for money, but today you're getting your legs back, you know? Very awesome. <clears throat> and here's another thing I want to point out here, which I think is just absolutely phenomenal, right? So in verse 6, it says, Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, walk. 
right? Okay. The book of Proverbs, chapter 22, the very first verse, okay? It reads, a good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver or gold. <laughs> and I think that just in the light of what we're talking about, right? Remembering the way the Holy Spirit teaches us to read the scripture, to know that he is the one who designed every single book, right? His fingerprint is all over this thing, right? When we see figures appear in scripture, a lot of times they correlate. And so something that we read from the beginning will be consistent in its use throughout the entirety of the book, okay? And having silver or gold associated to a name, all right, is, is phenomenal, right? This is scripture that I'm sure many of us have heard, right? A good name is more, de more desirable than silver or gold. And then when we read in Acts chapter three, verse six, it says what? He don't have silver or gold, but he has a good name. And that name can make you walk again. So it's, praise God, man. It's just some, some awesome insight uh, from the Holy Spirit right there. And another one for you, because once, once you get onto a particular trail like this, when you see figures, all oh, silver and gold, and, a, and being associated to a name, you you can search silver or gold if you have like a Bible app, right? You can go into your search engine, put in silver or gold or silver and gold and see what kind of pops up and see how many times silver and gold correlate to a name in scripture, right? And so another one that I found was in Zechariah chapter six, verses 11 and 12. Okay, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. The book of Zechariah is considered to be like the apocalypse of the Old Testament. It's like the book of Revelation in the Old Testament. Okay, Zechariah chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. It says, take the silver and gold and make a crown and set it on the head of the high priest, Joshua, son of Josadak. Tell him, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch. And he will branch out from his people and build the temple of the Lord. And there's absolutely awesome things here. You have a guy named Joshua who's a high priest. Okay. Now, if y'all do your word studies on the name of Joshua, it's the Hebrew equivalent to the Greek name Jesus, right? Jesus, okay? And so the Hebrew version of Jesus' name, which some people would say is Yahshua, uh, uh, Yeshua, some people would say Yahusha, some people would say yeah, different, different renderings for the name. Anyway, the name Joshua means Jehovah saves. Jehovah is salvation. And so here you have a silver and gold crown being placed on the head of a high priest named Joshua. And it says, here is the man whose name is the branch. And if you study the branch throughout scripture, right? In the, in the book of Genesis, when Noah was on the ark, he sends out the dove to see if there was any trees, right? Out there in the world and any, any dry land had appeared yet. And the dove comes back with an olive branch, right? In its talons. And again, um, when when Aaron is made high priest, okay, he had a, a rod, a branch that budded, and this was proving that God had selected him to become the high priest, okay, over the people of Israel from from the tribe of the Levites, right? So when you um, when you see the connections that are being made here, again, this particular character points to Jesus Christ perfectly. All right. Very awesome stuff. <laughs> so anyway, I thought you guys would enjoy that. The silver and gold correlating to a name and do your searches. You might find uh, plenty of others there that are point to Jesus. Right. So going back into the book of Acts, chapter three. All right. We left off at six. So we'll go from there. 
All right, so it says, uh, <clears throat> verse 7, taking him by the right hand, he helped him up, and instantly the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God, right? Because that's the only response that you can really have. If somebody gave you your legs back, right? <clears throat> and here we have a man who knew better than to praise these men, right? He gave the glory straight to God. He No confusion whatsoever. Like we're going to see later on, We'll have brothers out in different countries doing the works of the Holy Spirit and they'll heal people and, and they get treated like they were the gods, you know, but this man was an Israelite, right? He was a Jew. He was there at the temple, right? So he knows who God is, but now he's actually had an encounter, an awesome encounter from God. <clears throat> All right. And so, and so again, I mean, when we know how confident we can be in the word of God, knowing that these things are real and true. How awesome is it, right? Try to sympathize, empathize, put yourself there to see a man receive his, his ability to walk or to be someone who didn't have the ability to walk and, and was now healed by Jesus Christ. This is absolutely phenomenal. All right, so... When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him, right? And in today's day, we would have scoffers who'd be saying, see, he was faking it the whole time. He was just stealing our money. That's all he was doing. <clears throat> and the haters will hate. But again, we have confidence in this text. We have confidence in God's word because we see, we see his fingerprint all over it, right? He allows us to see it. So anyway, verse 11, while the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to see them in the, same, in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he said to them, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness, we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers has glorified his servant, Jesus. He just proclaimed the name, right? It's like, when God tells his people back in the, in the book of Exodus, he tells Moses to declare him to the people by this, right? Tell, say to them, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, okay? This is his memorial forever to the people, right? And here we see Peter using it so smooth, right? <clears throat> the God of Abraham... Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. If you remember that study, we talked about how it correlates to the Azazel, right? The goat the scapegoat that's released into the wilderness and then the goat that had no sin on it is offered up as the sacrifice for the day of atonement okay and so no matter what these people might say right god allowed this to happen this was his plan from the beginning and he's been showing us from the beginning okay jesus being crucified was not an accident it wasn't a, like a tragic uh, event to God and, 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 and his people. No, God knew this was going to happen. He's the one that planned it, right? And so it says, you killed the author of life, but raised, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. 
It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can all see. You know, one, one detail here that the brothers and I, we'd like to chop up different concepts as the Lord teaches us, right? Many people could have had this name, Jesus, okay? And so when they speak about Jesus' name, we're talking about the one whom, who, who is being referred to and identified, right? The, the true author of life, the one who was crucified and resurrected on the third day, right? It said, in him, his name, okay? And faith in him completely healed this man. So now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance as did your leaders. And this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer, right? God proclaimed this how? Through all the prophets, right? And so how is it that anyone could have missed it throughout all the books, all the scrolls, right? All the men who were crying out to the people. How could you miss it, right? <clears throat> The word of God says, because of the stubbornness and rebelliousness of the people, God closed their ears so they could not hear. He closed their eyes so they could not see. So even seeing, they were still blind. You understand? And so be careful not to be stubborn or rebellious with God because he will take away your ability to see. So 19, he said, repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out that times of refreshing may come from the Lord and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything as he promised long ago through his holy prophets. Okay, and so <clears throat> some awesome things here, right? They give us an until, right? Heaven must receive him until. And when that time comes that God is going to restore everything, we're still waiting for. Him. You understand? Heaven is still receiving Jesus, still holding him until God is ready to restore everything. And so hopefully we will be witnesses of that day. Right? And, and I mean, while we're still alive, being transformed to his kingdom. But... If we're set to die and the next generation gets to witness it, so be it. <clears throat> we're still going to see it. But anyway. So it says, for Moses said, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Okay. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. So now, Peter is pointing all the way back to Moses and declaring that what Moses said to the people about this prophet points to Jesus Christ. It points to the Messiah, okay? So no one can take this verse and cause it to mean something else, right? When you study uh, Islam, Right. And what Muslims will try to take this verse and apply it to Muhammad and say, oh, yeah, he's the final prophet. He's the one that Moses was talking about. Right. But we know these guys were saying that this this points to Jesus. This is 600 years before Muhammad, 600 years before Islam. OK. <clears throat> Already pointing. And I think if y'all are interested, my brother posted an awesome video about the subject. So you could check out the content on YouTube. Anyway, he'll walk you through it later. All right, so 24, it says, Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. 
All right. <clears throat> and so, again, we know that because of the way God establishes plan for redemption to redeem humanity to himself. Right. He did it through a man. He started his plan through a man. And then that man became a tribe. And then that tribe became a nation. And God swore to watch over the offspring of his friend Abraham and to be the God of his descendants. So God had to keep his eye on Israel. He had to be uh, in fulfillment of his own promises, right? Of his own covenant that he made. So when he says, yeah, God sent him, sent Jesus, sent the Messiah first to the Jews, okay? God is in keeping with all of his promises, all right? And God still extended mercy beyond that, even if you study the Old Testament. He allowed for foreign peoples to hear about God, to, to, to know his ways, and even to become proselytes, okay, to, to the faith of Abraham. And, they, and, and a lot of people did. <clears throat> but now, God is... He's, re he's removed that former covenant in order that he might expand uh, his salvation to the rest of the world. Now there's a new covenant. And under a new covenant is a new law and a new priest. Okay. And so that being the law of our Messiah, the law of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> All right, so Acts chapter 4, it says, The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. Okay, so remember, the whole buzz about Jesus resurrecting, right? All these people, the temple guard, the Sadducees, right? The priests, they knew even during the resurrection that Jesus was going to come back, okay? They even told the Romans like, yo, listen, we need people to guard the tomb because there's talk about this guy coming back from the dead after a certain amount of time. So they were trying to shut that down altogether. But since it happened, now, now these are the days after it happened, after the fact, okay? They're out there proclaiming that which these men feared even at the very death of Jesus, all right? Now they're bringing it about, uh, bringing that to fruition. And these dudes are still scared, still disturbed by it. <clears throat> and again, if y'all run to Jesus and he becomes your priest, you no longer need these guys. And so they were in danger of losing their positions, losing their business, <laughs> right? It's really what it was. <clears throat> All right, verse three, it says, they seized Peter and John and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. Okay, and one thing that's very awesome, God having this particular mercy where when his message is preached and he allows miraculous signs and wonders to be performed, he's accompanying, right, this miracle or that preaching with a miracle in order to authenticate it, in order to put his seal on it, his fingerprint, okay, to let the people in the region know what that man preached was truly my message. And here's the miracle that stands by it, that seals the deal, you know? <clears throat> and you'll see that take place several times throughout this book, but also in testimonies that you've heard in other countries, right? In the United States, Christianity is cliche, right? There's, there's a church on, like on every corner, on every block, you know? So we don't really witness a lot of miraculous signs and wonders. And at the same time, a wicked and adulterous generation don't get a sign, okay? And so, you know, if you see the way 
the states are now, it, we're just backwards. Everything out here is just terrible. <clears throat> However, in, in other countries, the Gentiles, people who have never heard the message before, right? It's just there's still some regions out there where Christianity is not widely known. Okay. When he sends his messengers out there, you'll have these men who can speak in tongues, right? Not having to study the language to speak to the people, but the Holy Spirit allowing them, enabling them to speak the language off the bat to these people so that they can hear the gospel. And on top of that, allowing these men to perform miraculous signs and wonders so as to authenticate them as his messengers and prophets. All right. <clears throat> so that's just that's just awesome the way God does it. All right. So the first time Peter preached, he had about 3000 joined the body. And now at this, they grew to about 5000. Right. So an additional 2000. I mean, could you imagine? In a matter of like two sermons, you know, the the, the uh, population of, of the church just growing in that regard. Very awesome. <clears throat> All right, verse five, it says, the next day, the rulers and uh, the elders and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there. And so were Caiaphas. John, Ale uh, John Alexander and the other high priest's family, oh, others of the high priest's family, okay? And so, <clears throat> again, when we see these guys together, even when we studied John, we talked about this a little bit, right? Annas, they considered the high priest, but they also considered Caiaphas the high priest. And you're like, what's up with that? You know, after looking into it, you can see that it, 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 one of these men, was the high priest that year according to the way that the Jews always did their their laws, right? Always kept the things of God. And the other guy, Caiaphas, was installed by the Romans, right? So he was like the, the one that they dealt with, okay? And so <clears throat> y'all could do your research into that, but you have these two figureheads, one respected by the people, the other respected by the Romans. And that's really what's going on with Annas and Caiaphas. And both of them wanted Jesus dead anyway, so they might as well be the same person, right? So verse 7 says, they, they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? And it's like, really? That same name that you've been trying to snuff out. Don't act like you don't know. All right, so. It said, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if you were being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. It's like you asked for it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like you walked right into that. Yep. By what power or by what name did you do this? I'll tell you. <laughs> Here's the microphone. Oh, sure. Let me just glorify him some more, right? <clears throat> he gave this man a platform. Jesus. It was Jesus. Right. So anyway. So it says, verse 11, Jesus is the stone you builders rejected. OK, which has become the chief cornerstone. All right. Now, if you remember, there's a text in scripture that talks about when Jesus asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? Right. And then he said, what about you? You know. And Peter proclaimed, oh, you know, you are the son of the living God, right? And uh, Jesus tells him, you know, it's awesome because I gave you the nickname, right? A stone, like a, a, a small stone. And you're the one that proclaims the, the stone, the actual boulder, the, cor the cornerstone, the foundation stone of the faith, right? He says that, that the church is going to be built on that proclamation right 
that that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. That's the building stone that the church is placed on, right? And here we see Peter reiterating that. Peter himself, right? The stone that you builders rejected. If you if you'll study, there are um some some people who teach that what he, uh, what Jesus was actually saying was that Peter was going to be the pope, right? He was going to be the stone that the church is built on and so forth. But here you see Peter himself letting you know he understood what the Lord was saying. He wasn't confused. <clears throat> okay. I say you we, we for all we know, he could have been calling Peter a, a stone because Peter was hard headed. You know what I mean? But anyway, here Peter points to, to Jesus being the chief cornerstone. And it's very awesome. And, and again, you can take this throughout scripture and play around with the stone. Look for the stone. Look for the rock throughout scripture, right? He is the rock of our salvation. Why would that even come up, right? If you, if you look in uh, the days of Moses, when Moses was talking with the Lord, he went up on the mountain and God said, I'm gonna let you see me. I'm gonna let you see a part of me, right? And so what does he do? He takes Moses and places him in the cleft of a rock. And then God says, don't look until I tell you. And God passed by almost completely and then allowed Moses to look and, and he saw God's back. And when he, at that moment, I'm absolutely certain that's when the glory of God stuck to Moses' face, right? The scripture says that God's Shekinah, the glory of God, remained on Moses' face so that when he came down from the mountain, the people couldn't even look at him because of the brilliance that was on him, God's glory, right? That radiation, okay? But anyway, who's the cleft of the rock that kept Moses safe from the presence of God, right? A cleft in the rock is the, it's a, it's a, a slice in a rock, it's a gash, it's a it's an opening. Okay. Remember when the people cried to Moses and asked for water, and God told them, See this, see that rock there? Strike the rock and then ask it for water. Right? Now we know the story. Moses struck the rock twice because the people pissed him off. However, that rock is is uh declared in scripture to be Jesus. It says that rock followed them in the wilderness for 40 years and provided water for them, okay? <clears throat> water. Jesus is the living water, right? So again, remember, there's no insignificant detail in scripture. When they say that you know, Jesus is the cornerstone, um, take that and run with it. Do your search in, in the engine, put in the word rock, put in stone, see all the things that come up, right? Very awesome. Jesus is <clears throat> in every single book of the Bible. And in the Old Testament. Word. He's in every single book if you look. <laughs> Amen. All right, so, and now look at what he says, right? Regardless of what the world might say, verse 12, salvation is found in no one else. Come on. Period. It says, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Oh. Straight up. Straight up. I don't care what they say. You know what I mean? I don't care how they feel. It's like when they say, oh, all faiths lead to God. Oh, you know, this person, he follows this way. That person follows that way. But it's all the same. We all serve the same God. <clears throat> that is a lie from the pit of hell. Okay? Straight up. Salvation is found in no one else. Jesus is the door. Right? He is the curtain. Right? He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. And on it goes. Okay? Jesus Christ alone. And so again, how do we encounter these people, right? When they proclaim these things and we know it not to be true. We have to be the ugly people. Right? We have to be the ones that say, yo, listen, with all due respect, okay, according to according to God's true words. There is only one Messiah. There is only one way to God. And if you hate me for telling you the truth, then so be it. But, it, you know, just like just like I would for my own friends, if I truly love somebody, I wouldn't let them walk off the cliff. You know, I wouldn't let them, uh, you know, run into the street when cars are, are coming by and so on. Right. 
you have to try and rescue that person and let them know, yo, you're headed in the wrong direction. Turn around, turn back. <clears throat> and that's true love, right? We know uh, like you have these false friends that they just love blowing you kisses, telling you, oh yeah, you know, you look, you look good in that, in that uh, shirt or those shoes look nice on you. No, they don't. You got some ragged shoes on your feet right now. You know what I mean? And you got to be that ugly person and be like, listen, you might need to change your shoes because there's some holes in, the, in them joints. <laughs> anyway, forgive me for that, but <clears throat> you got to be the ugly people. There's a witty really ugly people, you know? So anyway. <clears throat> All right. Where am I at here? Uh, 13. So 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men they were astonished and they took note that these men had been with jesus okay unschooled ordinary men right and now we have unschooled women as well and we out here we out here serving god you got papers i don't care i don't want to see them anyway so it says but since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. <clears throat> what are we going to do with these men? They asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. And see, that's just awesome, right? They can't deny the Lord's resurrection. They can't deny that the miracle was performed here, right? Because maybe when uh, an earlier analysis was done on that disabled man, they confirmed that he was truly disabled, whatever whatever they meant by that, right? They know that a, that a mirac uh, miracle has been done, a miraculous sign has been done, okay? And, and, and they could not deny it. How awesome is that? So it says, but to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Right. So now you have your governing authorities telling you, stop talking about Jesus. Right. Uh, you know, your boss, your principal, your, your whoever you are. Right. The police officer on the side of the road. Stop. Stop talking about Jesus. Let's see what the brothers did here. It says, Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied. All right, here's where you're going to highlight this verse right here. Which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? It says, You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard, okay? <clears throat> and the awesome thing is that even for us, all right, and I'll speak for myself on this one, like, even though I haven't witnessed these things myself with my eyes, right, to see those things that these guys said, I'm somebody thousands of years removed from these uh, events that took place. However, because of the awesome things that I've seen from God's word, okay? The times that he's showed up in my dreams, which people won't count as evidence anyway, but it's just for me. That's my personal revelation, right? What I know from God's word has given me such the confidence to know that he is real, that this is truly his word. <clears throat> we can take up that same confidence, Right. Even threaten us with death and we cannot help but speak about it because of what we've witnessed, because of what God has allowed us to know him by those things that he's revealed himself to us. We take up that same confidence, that same strength, that same conviction. Right. You ask the brothers here, it's like if anybody says stop speaking in the name of Jesus, who'd be like them? after further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. 
<laughs> okay? And so again, you know, when you look at who's getting the glory for the miracle, right? That should put fear. That struck fear in these men. Like, we got to be careful how we go about this because people are giving God the glory. He's not going to these men. And that right there should let you know anything about, right? Like the people of God preaching that you might hear, awesome sermons, uh, awesome teachings, whatever it is, right? People saying that they've done miracles or cast out demons or doing all this stuff. Who's getting the glory, right? And so you really, you really look into to, to your research with that. Like these, these kinds of things that the word of God gives us are like our filters as we're, as we're examining the world and other things, you know? <clears throat> and so it says 23. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father, David. Now, and here he quotes Psalm chapter two, right? It said, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? It says, the kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And so now all of a sudden, you know, these unschooled uh, dudes are quoting scripture everywhere, right? The Holy Spirit giving them the remembrance of, of the word. Very awesome. <clears throat> It says, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. So again, Peter is giving you scripture and direct correlation, the scripture and its fulfillment. OK. <clears throat> and so you, you no longer need to wonder. Oh, who's he talking about in Psalm chapter two? Now, nah, now you know, right? So he says, now, I'm sorry. He says, they did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. <clears throat> now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. OK, and so <clears throat> you, you might read this passage and go, but weren't they already filled with the Holy Spirit? What does this mean? Right. Now, they have the Holy Spirit as a passenger, right? Who sh the Holy Spirit shares their vessel with them. However, being filled with the Holy Spirit is consistent with all the times that we've seen it in the Old Testament. When the Spirit comes upon someone and causes for uh, 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 something miraculous to happen, something awesome to happen, okay? Now, it happened all the time in the past, right? Giving you one example, we'll use Samson because it happens so many times with Samson. It's so easy to bring up, right? Samson uh, would, was walking with his parents somewhere and a lion was like nearby getting ready to attack them. And it says the spirit of God came upon him and he tore the lion, right? He tore the lion apart. <clears throat> or, you know, the spirit of God would come upon him and he fought against like a thousand Philistine soldiers, right? And it's, it's just a momentary filling, okay? And then the spirit would leave that person. Now here, the spirit is remaining on these people, but filling them to the brim with encouragement, right? And, and firing them up to do the things of God. Okay, so <clears throat> there's nothing really confusing there. 
All right, so it said, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. It says, but they shared everything they had. <clears throat> now, again, remember last week we talked about identifying things, right? This is the stuff that the believers did, okay? The first ones that, that received the Holy Spirit, how they started to behave and conduct themselves, what kinds of things they did. And this is what we see happening in them, right? For those of us who have the Holy Spirit, we desire to do the same things, or we should desire to do the same things. Nurture those things in, in yourself. <clears throat> so it says, uh, 33, with great power, the apostles continue to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Okay, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all. It says that they were uh, that there were no needy persons among them, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, <clears throat> and it was distributed to anyone who had a need. Okay, and so this is not to say that, you know, everyone needs to go and sell their house now and bring the money to my house so I can give it to everybody, right? No. No, this is, uh, again, uh, making us to know. When you know that there's people who have a need, right? Make it your responsibility, you know? Like, offer up more of yourself or whatever you are able, right? Later on in the scripture, the word of God tells us that Everyone should have his own job, his or her own job, right? So that they have something to give, okay? So that it's whoever has a need, you can provide something for them. And that's really what it comes down to, <clears throat> all right? And so these people may have had, um, now notice it says from time to time, right? They own land that they probably weren't using. They had more than one house. God knows what, what is really going on here. However, they put that up for the sake of those in need. And that's really what the word of God is prompting us to. Like, you know that someone's in need. Don't just go and be filled and leave them hungry. Like, take care. You know, take care. <clears throat> All right. And so, 36. So it says, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas which means son of encouragement, okay? It says, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. All right, so we know of Barnabas. You study the rest of this book, you're gonna see Barnabas all over the place. But how many of us remembered his first true name, <laughs> right? So what happens is just the, the same way that Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is at hand, right? When there's a kingdom change, okay, there's a name change. And the same thing will happen to us. If you study the book of Revelation, it says, for those of us who are victorious, for those of us who overcome, those of us who prevail, okay, he will give us a stone with a new name on it, right? And so, you know, being blessed to have a new name because of what this man has done, they began to refer to him as the son of encouragement, right? It's like the son of charity, you know? <clears throat> and so it's very awesome. We remember the word bar means the son of, right? We talked about bar Abba, and now we have this guy bar Nabis, right? And so you can already see the compound word making, making a, a name for itself. Son of encouragement, okay? But his real name was Joseph, and he was a Levite, all right? So already part of the the tribe that was called to be a priest he had the opportunity of having that glory in the in the body of the jews and now having that glory in the body of christ very awesome all right so we thank you guys for for hanging with us um and may the lord bless you and keep you may the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you may the lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace God bless y'all. Back to scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, open up my mind. Open up my mind, meditating on the scripture. 
Meditating on your scripture Something new Every single time And every single time Blessed are the ones who meditate upon the words of God And the ones who take to heart what is written in them Each one is like a seed, taking its time to grow But at the harvest, the fruit is all of that and then some Every line is full of knowledge and wisdom Helping you to uproot the lies of the system Equipping you for every good work in the kingdom Preparing you and yours for the arrival of his son Scripture, meditating on your scripture Lord Jesus, open up my mind, open up my mind, meditating on the scripture, meditating on your scripture, something new every single time, and every single time. Whenever I read, there's always something new to learn. You open my mind to things that only you discern. Mysteries of your death and resurrection revealed in every section. The text bears your reflection from your infancy to your ascension. From your second coming, even unto eternity with the brethren. See, line for line, you told it all before it happened. Starting from when Eve ate and gave some to Adam. And that's when he made the choice to lay his life down. But you cursed him, sweating his eyes, thorns in the ground. Then you versed him upon the prophecy of the Lord who would sweat blood and be adorned with a crown of thorns. And what that means is that you knew from the beginning that you would trade yourself as an offering for his sinning. And like Adam, you would have to bleed to provide the death of your seed for the life of the bride. Come on, scripture, meditating on your scripture. Lord Jesus, open up my mind. Open up my mind, meditating on the scripture. Meditating on your scripture.